Hello, my name is David Ritchie and I serve as lead pastor of Redeemer Christian Church in Amarillo, Texas. We're excited that you're listening to this sermon today. We hope that you enjoy it. We hope it's a blessing to you. But we want you to know that this is in no way intended to be a replacement for your local church. In fact, we hope that you are a part of a local church, whether that's here at Redeemer Christian Church in Amarillo or a part of another local church. We want you to be a part of the body of Christ. Likewise, we want to let you know that the reason we're able to offer this freely to you is because of the generous donations that people have made to support the mission of Redeemer Christian Church. And so if you'd like to support us financially, we encourage you to go online at RedeemerChristianChurch.com and consider making a donation so that we can continue to be a church that declares the gospel of Jesus Christ and displays the gospel of Jesus Christ to our neighbors and to the nations. God bless you. Good morning, church. It's a privilege to be with you all today. Today's scripture reading is from the gospel according to Luke. We're in chapter 19. We're going to begin our reading in verse 28, and we're going to read through verse 40. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet. He sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away, and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent... The very stones would cry out. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for the precious gift of your revealed word. These spirit-inspired words that have been given to us that we might know you. And I do pray that your Holy Spirit would give us eyes to see your face, ears to hear your voice. Allow our hearts to recognize the salvation that only lies in Jesus Christ, who is your Son and our Lord. We pray this in the mighty name of our mighty King Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can have your seat today. When I was a little boy, I remember very vividly these memories of going to this place called Platoro, Colorado. It was a magical place for me as a child. When I was about four or five years old, one of these trips that we took as a family was, was with our whole extended family, and I, I remember this one special moment uh, of walking alongside the river and, and seeing something that looked like a, a shining stone, but as I reached my hands into the river, I pulled out a rainbow trout that had been stuck in the moss, and it was this amazing moment. I just caught a fish with my bare hands, and I knew that this was a special moment, and so I took it, and I put it in my bag, and I ran up to my family, and I was showing off what had just happened, and I brought the fish to my grandfather, and he said, well, David, would you like to clean it? You know, and as a a four-year-old, a five-year-old, everything was just magic and unicorns and and fairies. It was just just this wonderful, magical moment, this wonderful, magical place, and all of that changed when I said, yes, you may now clean it to my grandfather, because he He took my fish, and he took it under running water, and he took out his pocket knife. And then he plunged that pocket knife into the bowels of my fish and gutted it right in front of me, and it absolutely crushed me. It devastated me. I couldn't believe that he had done this. It was was something so shocking. It wasn't what I was expecting to happen at all. It wasn't what I wanted to happen, but it probably was in some sense exactly what needed to happen at that moment, because the truth was the the destiny of that fish's life did change the moment that I touched it. And that was the moment 
that things needed to change. It needed to be something different than what I had in my four-year-old, five-year-old mind, my set of expectations that were pre-prescribed. We're seeing this moment before us in Holy Scripture where oftentimes this story, this account in the life of Jesus Christ is described as the triumphal entry. King Jesus has just rode into the city of Jerusalem after a a very long journey from the northern region of Galilee to the southern region of Judea. He has finally arrived. Jerusalem is the city of ancient kings. It was once the seat of a great kingdom, but that was centuries ago. And since that time, God's people have disobeyed God. They have been sent into exile as a punishment. And even since that time, they have been restored to come back and live in their ancient holy land. The Jewish people returned from exile, and they were even able to rebuild the city. They were able to restore their temple. But there was one thing that had not yet happened, and that was the return of the king. There had not been a king that had reigned as God's anointed representative really since 586 B.C. It was a long time ago since God's people had their very own king and their very own kingdom. And so this hope that God would one day send an anointed king, a a liberator king, a deliverer king, this hope of what became known as the Messiah was very, very present among God's people at the time of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus of Nazareth enters into the holy city. And he's entering into the holy city with centuries of expectation, centuries of hype. And everyone in this crowd is asking, could this be Jesus? Could this be really rather the Messiah? Could this be the one who God has sent to be our liberator king? Is this the one who is meant to save us? And do these people really even know really what the terms Messiah and salvation actually mean. Because what we're going to find out today as we look into this text is that the king that they really want is so very different than the king that they need. The king that they have expectations set upon is something so radically different than what God is going to give them. And so let's look at this. Point number one, the king that we want. We'll look again at the beginning of our text today. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethany and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village that's in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, Its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, he's approaching from the east in what's known as the Jericho Road. And there's this final ridge that he is just now cresting, and it's called the Mount of Olives. And all of a sudden, this great city, the city of kings, has come into view, and he's entering into this city. Now, there's a few things that you need to understand about the political situation that's going on in Jerusalem at this exact moment in time. The situation was very politically tense. It was very polarized. On one side of the the polarization spectrum, you had people like the tax collectors. You had people like the Jewish aristocracy who believed that Roman reign, the, the Roman empire that was essentially in charge of this territory, that their rule and their reign was truly unavoidable. There was nothing we could do about the fact that Caesar was the most powerful man on earth. His army is the most powerful army on earth. There is nothing we can do to oppose this. And so they're like, guys, we, at least we're living in our land. At least we have something like the Jewish temple where we can go and worship our God. It's not optimal. We don't have our freedom. We're not an independent nation. We don't have our king. But things are okay. I mean, it could be a lot worse. Why, why don't we get with the flow of things? Why don't we get on the right side of history and on the right side of progress and say, we're just going to work with Rome rather than against it? We're going to make some compromises, and not everybody's going to like those compromises, but at least we'll have some sense 
of us being a distinct people living in the place that we want to live in. And on the other side of this situation, you had people like the Zealots. Now, Zealots were people that after century after century of oppression and being under foreign rule, they were very tired of not having a sense of Jewish independence. They were tired of the Jewish aristocracy making compromise after compromise that seemed to benefit them, but it never really benefited the people. And so they were angry. They're frustrated. They're tired of being talked down to. They're tired of the status quo and the establishment. And so what these guys would do is they would try to create a a situation of civil unrest. Um, This is actually the group of people where the phrase cloak and dagger come from. Uh, They would go inside of large crowds of people, usually when there was like a a government or a civic event happening, and they would try to find someone like a governor's aide and beneath a cloak have a dagger and then walk up beside them and stab them and walk away. And they wanted to start a riot. They wanted to start some type of a revolution. And even if that meant inviting a war that would eventually destroy the nation, they felt like freedom was better than living under any type of tyranny than any type of pagan rule from an outsider. And behind these very polar extremes, there was this wide group of people that were somewhere in the middle. They were yearning for freedom, but they were also yearning for security. And they hoped that one day, as they read through and as they studied and as they were in their synagogues and at temple worship services, hearing the words of the prophets being read and the promises of God being foretold, They were hoping that one day God would send a Messiah that would set them free, that would change their destiny, that would restore the greatness of the kingdom of God on earth. And so for this reason, there's actually a ton of significance by the fact that Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem riding on this colt of a donkey. It's It's actually kind of odd that in this section of Scripture, most of the verses are about how Jesus really needs to ride into Jerusalem on this donkey, on this unridden colt of a donkey. And why is that the case? Well, what Jesus is doing, he's he's actually stepping into the promises of old. He is stepping into the promises that were foretold by the prophets of God. And in fact, he is specifically fulfilling the promise of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. I'll read that to you now. These are the words of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He's coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. R.T. France, um, a New Testament scholar, observes that Jesus has just finished walking all the way from Galilee. So in other words, he's not just saying, guys, I'm kind of tired. I need to find a ride to actually go into the city of Jerusalem. That's not the, the main reason that he's going to mount this donkey and actually ride in. He's not going to be so exhausted that for the last two miles that he needs something to help him. To use a donkey now is nothing less than an absolute deliberate gesture saying, I want to signal in your minds something that is true about the nature of who I am. And it seems like the crowd gets it, so let's look at the text again. As he rode along, they spread their cloaks in the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This whole scene, as as many scholars have noted, evokes the image of a victory parade. Essentially, whenever a king would go out and he would battle an enemy, and when that king won, he would come back to his city and people would come out of the city and they would greet him and they they would essentially follow him into the city as they were celebrating the victory of this great king. And so, whether it's a king or a triumphant general, they're recognizing that, that Jesus is something special, that he really is someone that is, is going to be designed to meet some type of hope that they have deep in their hearts. And after the long years, without a kingdom, without a king, perhaps they are thinking that God's true liberator king has come. 
Maybe he was going to lead some type of a political revolution to kick Rome out and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And so here is what I want you to see that's, that's so important to understand Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and to see what happens after this moment. The Jewish people want and they expect a political leader to bring about a political kingdom. They want a military Messiah who's going to bring about a military victory. As New Testament scholar George Eldon Ladd writes, they wanted a king to deliver them from Rome, not a savior to redeem them from their sins. And as Jesus enters into the city, one of the other gospel accounts in the gospel of Matthew says that they shout out this particular word. They shout out the word, Hosanna. At that time, it's, it's interesting, the, the root word of the word Hosanna literally means save us. But that had become such an archaic term by that time that it was just kind of a random shout of praise, kind of like hallelujah. People said it all the time, but they didn't exactly know what it meant. And so there's a great irony that surrounds this moment, that they are crying out for salvation to the only one that can actually save them. But they're crying out, and as they're crying out, they do not know what they say, and they're not understanding the one that is truly before them. And I think this moment is important for us because we too, how often we too, look outside of Christ for other type of salvations that will never truly save us. We look for salvation, we yearn for salvation, but we look for it so oftentimes in the wrong place. We look to things in creation for an ultimate sense of of hope and meaning that things in creation are not designed to give to us. And so those pseudo-salvations that are outside of Christ might include a type of material salvation. We might look to money. We might look to the possessions that we can buy. We might look to a house that we could maybe one day afford and live in or a car that one day we can drive. And if we, we achieve these symbols of status... We feel like we have truly achieved a sense of value, maybe a sense of security that we have longed for for our whole life. And so, so much of our life can be centered on pursuing these things. We might look for social salvation. We might look for approval of the people that are around us or a sense of security or a sense of significance in our community. We might look for a sense of fame. What we're searching for is a sense of value and that our lives truly have meaning and purpose. We might look for relational salvation. We, we want a friend group to really belong in. We want a romantic relationship or maybe even a spouse that, that will make us feel loved and like we have a sense of belonging. We might look for political salvation. That if our political team wins, it will bring about heaven on earth. And if the other political team wins, it will bring about this absolute apocalypse. And we center so much of our hope and so much of our fear on the kingdom of man as opposed to the kingdom of God. And some of these things, are, they're not bad things in of themselves. But when they become ultimate things in our hearts, they will crush us. And that's something we have to understand as we look into this text today is, What are truly the salvations that we are looking for in our life? What are the the, the messiahs that we are looking to to bring about that salvation? Because if we place messianic expectations on anything else other than Jesus, it will fail us. That nothing and no one other than Jesus is strong enough to bear the weight of your most ultimate hope. That brings us to point number two, the, the king that we need. As the crowds call out to Jesus, the words that they choose are fascinating. They say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And so they, they understand the reference. They understand why Jesus is riding on a colt. They understand that he is a king of sorts. But look at the, the psalm that they're alluding to. This is a direct allusion to an Old Testament quote, Psalm chapter 118. This is that quote in context says, open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. In other words, this is a psalm of a king, a king who is coming into his city with victory. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. 
I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And here's what the people of Israel have just said. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. This psalm is filled with more meaning than anybody in Jerusalem could possibly realize. As Jesus rides into the city gates, we see that the Messiah has come, that Jesus has come, that Jesus is king, that Jesus is even the way of righteousness and salvation. But we also see something fascinating, that Jesus will be rejected, that he is the cornerstone that the builders have rejected. The people of Jerusalem, they want a strong military leader. And what they get is a humble rabbi, a brilliant preacher of the word of God, a healer of the sick, a feeder of the hungry, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So for this reason, the excitement that is surrounding Jesus soon fades. Upon his arrival, it becomes clear that Jesus of Nazareth is not going to be the Messiah that the people want. Instead of overturning Roman rule, the only thing Jesus is going to overturn is a few tables in the temple. Instead of laying out his first hundred-day plan and policy points as the new king of Judah, Jesus is going to tell the people that they should render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. Other than offending the religious establishment so much that they want to kill him, it would appear like Jesus really hasn't accomplished much. In fact, we, we see that that rejection is coming and it's coming very soon. The foretaste of that rejection comes in the last few verses of this passage. If we look at verse 49, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered him, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now for a moment, let's try to be sympathetic toward the Pharisees. These are are men who really study the word of God. They treasure the scriptures that God has given to his people. They want to obey God's word. They want to take it very seriously. And all of a sudden, out of Galilee, comes this rabbi out of nowhere. We see him teaching, and he's preaching, and he's amassing these huge crowds of people around him. People are beginning to follow him. And now, these people are following him, and they're marching toward Jerusalem, and they're doing things that would signify that they believe he is a king. And they're, they're even seemingly worshiping him. So at face value, there's a lot of things to be concerned about this. Because, I mean, first of all, no matter how great a teacher of God's word might be, no man who is just a man deserves to be worshipped. We would agree with that. Secondly, if enough Jewish people start calling this Jewish guy king, and they start treating him like a king... Rome is not going to like that very much. Uh, They're actually going to get pretty upset about that. They might even get upset enough that they're going to send an army and they might destroy the city of Jerusalem. And so, no wonder then the Pharisees say, "Uh, Jesus, would you mind if you could kind of get your people in order? Tell them to quiet down. Tell them to not treat you this way. Uh, Because first of all, we don't want blasphemy. Second of all, and even more, we do not want Rome to conquer us. We do not want Rome to destroy us. And then Jesus responds in such a way that I think would have absolutely blown their hair back. When Jesus says that if my followers were silent, that even the stones themselves would cry out, he's essentially telling the Pharisees, you may not recognize who I am, but the ground that we walk on does. That I am the one who made the earth and the sky. I am the one that the heavens declare my glory, that creation itself groans for the redemption that only I can bring. And so if Jesus is just a really charismatic and impressive teacher, for him to say these things is the absolute height of heresy and blasphemy and delusional pride. But Jesus is who he says he is. And because of that, Jesus is speaking no more than the simple truth. 
Jesus is who he says he is. He is worthy of nothing less than our absolute worship, our absolute devotion, our absolute praise. He is worthy of us laying our coats down on the road in front of him. He is worthy of nothing less than our absolute wholeness of our lives. But the triumph of the triumphal entry will not last long. Suddenly the tide will change against Jesus. The Some of the very voices that are crying out Hosanna to Jesus will soon cry out, crucify him. And if you had lived then, and if you had seen what was about to happen to Jesus, you would say that Jesus was just another would-be Messiah, one of the many would-be Messiahs that were in the ancient world, that his name was soon to be forgotten, but you would have been wrong. Because you see, Zechariah's prophecy, if we read it more carefully, we see something more about who Jesus is revealing himself to be. Zechariah, the same prophet who foresees that the king who is riding into Jerusalem humbly and on the fault of the coal of a donkey, he's going to be a shepherd king. A shepherd king who is going to be rejected. A shepherd king who is going to be pierced. This is Zechariah, the prophecy that goes on describing this king, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. That Jesus Indeed, is the Messiah, and he has come to fight a messianic battle that would save God's people. But rather than fighting a battle that would result in the people of God being delivered from the tyranny of men, Jesus' battle is going to focus on delivering us from the tyranny of sin. That Jesus is going to come, and he's bringing about an invasion of heaven on earth. But it's not going to come through conquest. It's going to come through a crucifixion. That through death on a cross, Jesus will defeat death itself. What we see in this is that we so much like the crowds of Jerusalem often cry out for salvation, but we don't understand what we're crying out for. We fail to recognize true salvation when it's right in our midst. We look to the pseudo-salvations of this world and we forget the gospel that is before us. And I think in this age that we live in, an age that is also filled with polarization and angst, that we can learn this lesson today that the king that we want is often very different than the king that we truly need. So Redeemer Christian Church, may we be a people who look to God and that we would worship God, not for who we would want him to be or prefer him to be, but for who we need him to be and for who he is, that we would join the cry of creation, and that we would declare the glory of this God, and that we would look forward to the day when this King returns in great victory over all. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you are a God who so persistently and consistently defies our expectations. Lord, if we were to receive the the salvation that oftentimes our hearts cry for, it would consume us. It would destroy us. So, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would unveil our eyes so that we can see Jesus for who he truly is. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work upon our hearts today and to see how our hearts can further rest in who he is and what he has done. Lord, we crave so many things. We are seeking rest in so many things, but our hearts are truly restless until they rest in you. So by your mercy, would you guide our hearts to the hope that is only in your gospel? And Lord, may we be a people that that respond with praise and worship with our lives. And may we be a people who are defined by our hope in your everlasting kingdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen.